Chapter 1. Murder in Jamaica It was 6.15 on a peaceful afternoon in February. The sun was sinking low in the sky over Kingston, the capital city of the beautiful island of Jamaica. It had been a hot day, but the air was cooler now. Insects and frogs had started to call and sing. A man had just left a large white building with wide grass lawns and tall trees in front of it. This was a club where he met his British friends. He went to the club every afternoon to have a cool drink. Now he was going to his house, where he also had an office. The man's name was Commander John Strangways, and he was Regional Control Officer for the Caribbean. Strangways worked in Jamaica for the British government, but he was really an agent of the British Secret Intelligence Service. He was a British spy who worked in Jamaica. Lots of people knew Strangways was a spy because he was not careful enough about his secret. Every evening at 6.30, Strangways had to contact London and transmit his report to the headquarters of the Secret Intelligence Service on a radio transmitter. The time in Jamaica was five hours behind the time in London. If it was 6.30 p.m. in Kingston, in London it was 11.30 p.m. When Strangways had sent his report, he waited to receive his orders from the Secret Intelligence Service. If Strangways couldn't make contact with the SIS in London at 6.30 p.m., he had to try again at 7 p.m., and if he couldn't send his message at this time, he would try again at 7.30 p.m. If London hadn't heard from him at that time, the SIS wouldn't try to contact him again. The headquarters would declare an emergency. They would immediately start an investigation. They would try to find out why Strangways had failed to make contact. Strangways never changed his routine. He did the same things at the same times every afternoon. Every evening at 6.15 he left the club where he met his friends and he started his journey back to his office. And every evening he took the same route in his car. He drove along the same streets. Every evening at 6.25 John Strangways met his assistant, Mary Trueblood, at the office. By 6.25, Miss Trueblood had always prepared the radio transmitter so that it was ready for Strangways to send his report to London immediately. On this February evening, three large men had been waiting for Strangways on the street near the club. As soon as Strangways came onto the empty, silent street, they started to walk towards him. The three men were all wearing dark glasses and carrying white sticks. The men were walking together in a line, one behind the other. The first man was holding a little metal cup. The second and third men were each touching the shoulder of the man in front of them. Strangways began to walk towards his car. He looked at the men and thought that they must be blind beggars. There were some beggars in Kingston, but perhaps Strangways should have been surprised to see three blind beggars together. And he should certainly have been surprised that all three men were Afro-Chinese. This was an unusual mixture of races in Jamaica. Meeting three blind Afro-Chinese men begging together should have seemed very strange to Strangways, but he was thinking about his evening transmission. Strangways carelessly put a coin in the tin cup as he passed the three beggars, and he walked on. So he didn't see the men turn around and pull guns from their pockets, and he didn't really feel the bullets which hit him a moment later. He was dead before his body hit the ground. A few seconds later, a big black car appeared in the street. It was a hearse the kind of car that is used for funerals. It was driven by a fourth Afro-Chinese man. The three killers suddenly took off their dark glasses and quickly opened the doors at the back of the hearse. They threw their glasses and their white sticks into the car. 
Then they picked up the body of the British agent and pushed it into a wooden coffin which was in the back of the hearse. A few moments later, they had got into the car and it had driven away. At 6.25, Mary Trueblood heard the door of the office opening behind her. "'The transmitter is ready for you, sir,' she said, turning around to welcome her boss. But it wasn't Strangways who was standing in the doorway. It was a large Afro-Chinese man, and he was pointing a gun at her heart. Mary Trueblood opened her mouth, but the man shot her before she could scream. A few minutes later, she was with her boss. Both of their bodies were in the coffin in the back of the hearse, and the office of the regional controller was on fire. Another hour later, and the killers had put some heavy pieces of metal into the coffin with the bodies. Then they had dropped the coffin into the deep water of a lake which was many miles from Kingston. Chapter 2. Bond's Mission The secretary, Miss Moneypenny, looked up and said, You can go in now, Commander. M's ready to see you. Commander James Bond, an agent of the British Secret Intelligence Service, walked into the office of the head of the Secret Service. Bond was a tall, strong, handsome man with black hair. He greeted his boss and sat down. M, no one at headquarters ever called him anything else, was sitting at his desk reading some papers. The old man glanced up at Bond. How are you, 007? he asked. M knew James Bond very well. The commander was one of his best agents. But in this office, Bond was only ever called by his work name. Only the very best SIS agents had work names which began with double O. An agent whose work name began with two zeros was always sent on the most difficult and dangerous missions, and sometimes he was ordered to kill enemies of his country. He also had permission to kill people if they attacked him. James Bond, Agent 007, had a license to kill. Bond looked at M, but he didn't reply immediately to M's question. The agent's cool, blue-gray eyes didn't show his feelings, so his boss spoke again. "'Are you well now, 007? Are you ready to start work again soon? I have a special mission for you. You're going to Jamaica. I want you to investigate a case there.' Several months earlier, in Paris— Bond had been injured in a fight with a Russian agent. The woman had been an important member of Smirsch. Smirsch was the department of the Soviet intelligence service which trained people to kill enemy agents. The Russian had very nearly killed Bond with a knife which was hidden in her shoe. The knife had been covered with poison. Bond had made a mistake on that mission— he hadn't guessed how the woman would fight or what weapons she had hidden. He'd almost died, and it was his own fault. Bond knew that, and M knew it too. Bond had been in hospital after the fight. The poison had made him very ill. He'd been away from work for many weeks, but now he wanted to get back to his job, and he was pleased that M wanted him for a special mission. He'd been worried that M no longer trusted him because the mission against the Russian woman had gone so wrong. He wanted very much to be trusted again. If M thought that Bond had lost his nerve, Bond's job as a special agent was finished. He would lose his double-zero work name. M would take away his license to kill. "'Tell me about the Jamaican mission, sir,' Bond said." Well, it'll be an easy investigation, M said, but I have to send someone to Kingston to check the facts. I want you to confirm what I suspect. You'll be able to find the answers and close the case in a day or two, I'm sure. Then you can spend some time on the beach. You still need to rest, 007, and you need to get back your... your confidence. 
This easy mission will help you. It'll build your confidence again. Bond was angry. M didn't want to say that Bond had lost his nerve, so he spoke about building his confidence. But Bond knew what his boss really meant. It was clear that M didn't trust him again. Not yet. But Bond wanted M to trust him again, so he hid his anger. "'What has happened in Jamaica, sir?' he asked quietly. "'John Strangways, our regional control officer for the Caribbean, has disappeared,' M replied. "'His assistant has also disappeared. "'One day, three weeks ago, Commander Strangways didn't make his evening transmission. "'The next day we heard some strange news. "'Strangways' office had been set on fire, and everything in it had been destroyed.' No bodies were found in the burnt building. Nobody has seen Strangways or his assistant, Miss Trueblood, since the fire. The acting governor of Jamaica thinks that Strangways was in love with the girl and that he ran away with her, M continued. He thinks that the two of them stole some money which belonged to the British government. Then they set fire to the office to cover their tracks. I agree with the acting governor, 007, M went on. Strangways and the girl haven't left Jamaica using their own names. We know that. We've checked the seaports and the airport, but Strangways could have made false passports for them both quite easily. In fact, he controlled the preparation of British passports on the island. That was part of his job. But we need to confirm all this. That's why I'm sending you to Kingston." You'll be the service's acting regional controller on Jamaica while you find out what really happened to Strangways and True Blood. You'll do Strangways job until I find new people to send. I'll take the next flight to Kingston, sir, Bond said. But I think that you're wrong about Commander Strangways. I know him. I don't think that he would steal money. And I don't think that he would destroy his office and run away. He loved his country. And he loved his work. I don't know, Miss Trueblood. I agree that it's quite possible that Strangways had fallen in love with her. He does fall in love rather easily. But if he wanted to leave Jamaica and live with Miss Trueblood, he would have resigned from his job. I'm sure about this. He wouldn't set fire to his office and run away. Love can make people behave very strangely, 007, M replied. But I want you to find out the truth. Is there anything else that you want to know? Well, I'd like to know about the last case that Strangways was working on before he disappeared, Bond said. There might be a connection. M picked up a brown file from his desk. There was a little problem about a place called Crab Key, he told Bond. It's a small island between Jamaica and Cuba. There are some rare birds there. Six weeks ago there was a complaint that some of these birds had been killed. I thought that the complaint was nonsense, but I asked Strangways to investigate. All the details are in here. He gave Bond the file. Take it away and read it. Chapter 3 THE ISLAND OF THE BIRDS The story in the file which M. had given Bond was a strange one. For many years the island called Crab Key had belonged to Britain, and Jamaica had looked after it. In the nineteenth century Crab Key had been rich because of guano. The guano came from a kind of bird called the green cormorant. Huge numbers of these birds visited the island and left their droppings. The guano, the bird's droppings, was full of chemicals called nitrates, which were used as fertilizers. Farmers in Europe spread guano on the ground to make their crops grow. Guano became one of the most valuable products in the world. There were only a few areas in the world where guano could be collected. Sometimes the price of guano was very high. At those times, the workers on Crab Key were busy. But when the price of the guano was low, work stopped on the island. 
This was because the guano on the island was not of very high quality. The highest quality guano could be bought from Peru. The guano from Crab Key couldn't be sold for as much money as Peruvian guano. Collecting the guano and transporting it to Europe cost too much money when the price was low. From 1900 to 1930, guano prices had been low, so all the people left Crab Key. But at the end of that time, the island became famous for another reason. Scientists discovered that a rare kind of bird, the roseate spoonbill, was living there. Almost all the roseate spoonbills in other parts of the world had died, but a lot of them were still living on Crab Key. Many people had been excited by this discovery, and the members of the Audubon Society were the most excited. The Audubon Society bought a lease from the British government officials on Jamaica for the small part of Crab Key where the birds lived. This part became a sanctuary for the spoonbills. The society sent two wardens to live on the island. These men studied the roseate spoonbills, and they made sure that no one harmed the rare birds in their sanctuary. Then suddenly, in the 1940s, the price of guano increased. At that time, a man contacted the governor of Jamaica. He wanted to buy Crab Key. This man was called Dr. Julius No. Bond learned from the file that one of Dr. No's parents was German and the other was Chinese. Dr. No offered a lot of money for the island. He also said that the Audubon Society could keep their lease on the small area where the spoonbills lived. The governor of Jamaica talked to the government officials in London, and they decided to accept Dr. No's offer. Since 1942, the island of Crab Key had been owned by Dr. No. Dr. No had moved many workers to the island, and for some years the price of guano was high. But at the beginning of the 1950s, the price fell again. Dr. No had kept his workers on the island, but nobody could understand why. He couldn't be making any money from the guano now. Then Bond read about what had happened in December of the previous year. One of the wardens from the Spoonbill Sanctuary on Crab Key had arrived on the north coast of Jamaica in a canoe. The man had been badly injured in a fire. Most of his body had been terribly burned, and he died a few days later. But before he died, the warden told a very strange story. He said that one evening a huge dragon had attacked his camp in the sanctuary. The dragon had breathed fire. It had burnt the camp with flames which came from its mouth. The dragon had burned him and killed the other warden. After that, it had gone into the sanctuary, and it had started to attack the spoonbills. Most of the birds had been killed, and many had flown away in fear. The story about a fire-breathing dragon was hard to believe, of course. The police in Jamaica thought that the warden's injuries had made him mad. But the Audubon Society sent two more people from the United States to investigate what had really happened. Unfortunately, their plane crashed as it tried to land on Crab Key, and both men were killed. Later, Dr. No told the Society that the plane had been flying too fast as it tried to land. Soon after the plane accident, an American ship was sailing near Crab Key. The captain of the ship had contacted the Audubon Society. He reported that he hadn't seen any roseate spoonbills living on the island. The Audubon Society had complained about this to the American government. Government officials in America had informed the British government. Officials in London had passed the facts on to the Secret Intelligence Service. They asked SIS to investigate the island discreetly. They didn't want to make any problems for the officials in Jamaica. But there was a difficulty. The island no longer belonged to Britain. Dr. No owned it. And he didn't like anyone except his own workers going there. He didn't want anyone else to visit Crab Key. But something had to be done about the complaints, so M had made a decision. 
he'd told John Strangways to investigate Crab Key. It was the case that Strangways had been working on when he and his assistant had disappeared. Bond read the notes in the file carefully. He was worried. He went to speak to his boss the next day. I've read the file, sir, and I believe that Commander Strangways and Miss Trueblood have been killed, he told M. Six people have died recently because they visited or tried to visit Crab Key. Something bad is happening there. I'm sure that you'll find out the truth, 007, M replied, but be discreet and enjoy your holiday in the sun. After that, you can get back to some real work. Chapter 4 The Girl at the Airport James Bond looked out of the window of the plane. The sound of its four large engines had changed a little. It was beginning to descend. The plane had already flown over Cuba, and it was now preparing to land. The bright afternoon sun was shining down on the sparkling blue water of the Caribbean Sea. Ahead, Bond could see the beautiful green island of Jamaica. As the big plane turned towards Kingston Airport, Bond thought about the man who was waiting there to meet him. The man's name was Quarrel, and he was a good friend. Bond had worked with the huge black man five years before. At that time, Quarrel had helped him on a very difficult and dangerous mission, and now Bond needed his help again. Quarrel wasn't a Jamaican. He'd been born in the Cayman Islands, but he was very well known in Jamaica, and everyone who knew him loved him. If Bond had quarrel by his side, ordinary Jamaican people would talk to him. People would trust Bond because he was Quarrel's friend. If Quarrel works with me, Bond thought, I'll be able to find out things that the people at King's House won't be able to tell me. The men and women who worked at King's House, the headquarters of the British government on Jamaica, weren't going to be able to give him much more information, so getting information from ordinary Jamaicans was going to be very important. But there were two other reasons why Bond wanted to work with Quarrel again. The first reason was that Quarrel knew everything about boats and the sea. He'd been a fisherman all his life. He knew more about sailing small boats around the coast of Jamaica than anyone else. If Bond had to go secretly to Crab Key, Quarrel could get him there safely by boat. And the second reason was that Quarrel was very fit and strong. He kept himself very fit, and he knew how to make other people fit, too. He would help Bond to get strong again. Bond had lost a lot of strength since his illness. Now Quarrel would be Bond's personal trainer. Bond wasn't going to investigate the mystery of Crab Key until he felt strong again. The plane's wheels touched the ground, and Bond got up from his seat. In a few minutes, he would be in the airport building. Bond hoped that he could collect his two cases quickly. His office in London had arranged for the airport staff to unload Bond's cases from the plane first, and he knew that no one at the airport would look inside them. This was a good thing. The cases contained many things that Bond didn't want anyone to see, including his guns, a .32 Walther PPK and a .38 Smith & Wesson. Bond saw Quarrel as soon as he walked into the main building of the airport. The huge, brown-skinned man looked exactly the same as when Bond had last seen him. There was a wide smile on the Cayman Islander's handsome face. "'How are you, Captain?' Quarrel asked as he shook Bond's hand. Quarrel had always called Bond Captain. "'It's good to see you again,' Quarrel went on. Then he looked carefully at his friend's face. "'Have you been ill?' he asked quietly. "'Yes,' replied Bond. "'I had a problem with some Russians. "'A lady from Smirsh poisoned me. "'She didn't like me very much. "'But I'm getting stronger every day, "'and you'll soon get me completely fit, I know that. "'After a week of your training, I'll be ready for anything.' "'The two friends picked up Bond's cases "'and walked towards the main doors.' 
But as they were about to leave the airport, something happened which worried Bond. A young Chinese woman with a large camera ran up to them. Before Bond could do anything to stop her, she'd taken a photo of him. The girl looked at a piece of paper which she took from her bag. It was a list of names. "'You must be Mr. Bond,' she said. Then she smiled. Bond was suspicious. He thought that the smile was false. "'I work for the newspaper here in Kingston, the Daily Gleaner,' the girl went on. "'I'm a reporter. I try to talk to all the interesting people who visit our island, and I always take their photograph. The readers of our paper like to know about new visitors.' "'And I'm sure that you're a very interesting person. "'Will you be staying in Kingston, Mr. Bond?' "'Yes, but not for long,' Bond replied. "'His voice was cool and unfriendly. "'I'm on my way to somewhere else.' "'And which hotel will you stay at while you're in Kingston?' the girl asked. "'She smiled, her false smile again. "'The Metal Bank Hotel. "'And now I'll say goodbye to you,' Bond said. "'The two men left the airport building,' and started to walk towards the car park. Quarrel, have you seen that girl taking pictures at the airport before? Bond asked. Well, no, Captain, his friend answered, but the Daily Gleaner employs many reporters. As they walked, Bond was thinking carefully. This was a bad start. If his name and photo appeared in the paper, everyone would know that he had arrived on the island. Bond certainly didn't want everyone to know about his arrival. Mistakes that you make at the start of a mission are the hardest mistakes to correct, Bond said to himself. He sometimes thought of his work as a kind of very dangerous sport, and he knew that in this sport of spying, it was bad if the enemy won the first game. But was there an enemy here on Jamaica? Perhaps he would soon know the answer to that question. After a minute, the two men reached the car which Quarrel had brought to meet him. Then Bond knew that the reporter had been only the first of his problems. The car was a black sunbeam alpine, and it had British government registration plates. In a few seconds, Bond realized that this was the car which had been used by Strangways, the regional controller who had disappeared. Quarrel, he said angrily, why on earth did you bring this car to meet me? Shall I put a sign round my neck with the words British Spy written on it? The acting governor's assistant told me to bring this car, Quarrel replied. His boss told him that you should use it while you're in Jamaica. It really belongs to your department. Did I do something wrong, Captain? In a moment, Bond's anger had disappeared. He wasn't angry with Quarrel. This was the acting governor's fault. Now Bond was only angry with himself. He was angry with himself because he'd forgotten an important fact. This fact was that the acting governor was an idiot. No, it wasn't you who did anything wrong, he told his friend. It was me. I sent a message to the acting governor. I asked him to contact you in the Cayman Islands. I asked him to bring you to Jamaica and to pay you well for working with me. I asked him to book me a room at the Blue Hills Hotel. I asked him to give me a car for the time that I was in Jamaica, and I asked him to send you to meet me today. But I didn't guess that he would send you to meet me with Strangway's car, Bond went on. Any enemy of Britain will recognize this sunbeam. It's the resident British spy's car. I should have guessed that this might happen. I should have taken a taxi to the hotel and met you there. Now anyone who was watching for me at the airport will know who's helping me, and they'll know which car we're driving. It was now late afternoon, and the sun was going down fast. It would soon be dark. The two men got into the sunbeam. Quarrel started the car's engine and drove away from the airport. After a few miles, Bond's fears were confirmed. He was now sure that an enemy had been watching at the airport. There's a car following us, Quarrel, he said quietly. It's a taxi, a big black one. I saw it leaving the airport, but there's nobody in it except the driver. Taxi drivers don't leave the airport if they don't get a passenger after waiting for only a few hours. They wait for the next plane to arrive. Slow down a little. 
Let's see if the taxi will pass us. Quarrel slowed down and Bond turned around in his seat. The taxi slowed down too. Its headlamps shone on the road. The driver was trying to stay about a hundred yards behind the sunbeam. Listen carefully, Bond said. We need to get rid of this taxi. A mile ahead of us, this road divides at a junction. The road on the left goes to Kingston, and the road on the right goes to Morant. Isn't that right? Yes, Captain, that's right, Quarrel agreed. The taxi driver thinks that we're going to Kingston, Bond said. The girl with the camera must have given him that information, or perhaps someone else had already told him. Well, we are going to Kingston, but not yet. Quarrel, when I tell you, I want you to accelerate suddenly. Drive very fast to the junction so that the taxi driver can't see which road we take. When we reach the junction, turn off all the car's lights and take the road towards Morant. Stop after 500 yards. Okay, accelerate now. Quarrel did exactly what Bond asked, and a minute later the two friends were listening to the taxi disappearing fast down the road to Kingston. Half an hour later, Quarrel stopped the sunbeam outside the Blue Hills Hotel. Neither man noticed the big black taxi which stopped on the dark street opposite the hotel. Later that evening, after he'd taken a cool shower and changed his clothes, Bond met Quarrel again. Let's go and have a drink and a meal, Bond said to his friend. Where shall we go? I'll take you to a restaurant that I know, Quarrel replied. It isn't a place where British people go very often, but the owner is a good friend of mine. He's called Pussfella, and I've known him for a very long time. Pussfella comes from the Cayman Islands, too. We used to go fishing together. Each of us owned half of the boat that we used. Then one day my friend had an accident. He was badly injured. After that, he didn't want to be a fisherman any more. I bought his half of the boat, and he moved here to Jamaica. He's made much more money from his restaurant than I have from fishing. What kind of accident did your friend have? Bond asked. A bad one, Captain, Quarrel replied seriously. Pussfella was fishing near an island called Crab Key. It's about halfway between here and Cuba. A huge creature came out of the sea. It was a giant squid. Or maybe it was a giant octopus. It pulled Pussfella from the boat. It tried to pull him under the water and drown him. He fought with the creature. He stabbed its tentacles with his knife until it let him go. That's why we call him Pussfella. Bond thought about this story and said nothing. Pussfella's a fine man, Quarrel added. And the food and the music at his restaurant are great. Chapter 5. Threats and Dangers Bond had to agree with his friend. Pussfella was a fine man, and the food and music at his restaurant were great. Bond drank his favorite cocktail, a vodka martini, and Quarrel drank cold beer. As they ate a delicious meal, the two friends listened to a group of musicians who were playing Jamaican songs. Quarrel... Tell me more about this island called Crab Key, Bond said, when they had finished eating. It's a bad place, Captain, the Cayman Islander replied. It's very bad luck to go there. A Chinese gentleman owns it. When he bought it, he took some men and women there to collect the bird droppings, the guanu. But he doesn't let any of his workers leave the island, and he doesn't let anyone else visit his island. He has guards with powerful guns who watch the coast of Crab Key, and he has a radar system and a plane. He uses these things to search for strangers on his island. Some friends of mine have disappeared there. They were fishermen. They landed on the island, and no one has ever seen them again. That's very interesting, Bond said quietly. Then he told Quarrel about Strangways and Mary Trueblood and when they had disappeared. Captain, Quarrel said, 
If Mr. Strangways and his assistant were interested in Crab Key, that Chinese gentleman ordered them to be killed. I'm sure about that. He hates people who become interested in his island, and he kills anyone who interferes with his privacy. There was a movement behind their table and a sudden flash of light. Bond turned round quickly. The young Chinese woman from the airport was standing in a corner of the restaurant. She was holding up her camera. She was going to take another picture. Stop her, quickly, Bond whispered to Quarrel. Quarrel jumped up from his chair and stood in front of the girl. He smiled at her. Good evening, miss, he said politely. He held out his hand. The girl smiled her false smile and put her hand in Quarrel's to shake it. But Quarrel grasped her hand very tightly and swung her round, moving like a dancer. Then he pulled her arm up behind her back. Don't do that! You're hurting me! Let me go! The girl shouted angrily. I'll report you to the police! My friend and I are going to ask you some questions, miss, Quarrel said. I hope that you'll give us good answers. The girl looked at Bond. Please, tell this man to let me go, she said. Perhaps I'll tell him to let you go when I've heard your answers, said Bond. Why are you trying to take more pictures of me? The photo that I took at the airport wasn't good, the girl answered angrily. My boss told me to get a better one. Are you talking about your boss at the Daily Gleaner, or are you talking about some other boss? The girl didn't answer. Bond looked carefully at her face for a moment. Then he asked, What's your name? I won't tell you, the girl said. Quarrel pushed her arm further up her back. She fought like a fish that was caught in a net, but Quarrel's arms were as strong as steel. The girl screamed. Okay, I'll tell you, she said. My name is Annabel Chung. At that moment, Pussfella came up to the table. Is this girl making trouble for you, sir? he said. Shall I make her leave? No, thank you, Pussfella. We want to talk to her. Bond replied, but there is something you can do for us. Please phone the office of the Daily Gleaner. Ask them if they employ a photographer called Annabel Chung. Pussfella hurried away. I'm sorry, Bond said to the girl, but I can't understand why you or your boss want pictures of me. I'm just an ordinary traveler. I'm visiting Jamaica for a day or two. Why are you interested in me? I've told you already, the Chinese girl replied angrily. It's my job to take photos. At that moment, Pussfella returned. The people at the paper know her, he told Bond. She isn't a reporter, she's a photographer. The people at the Daily Gleaner don't employ her, but sometimes they buy photos from her. She's a freelance photographer. She takes pictures for anyone who wants them. Thank you, Bond said. He smiled as the restaurant owner went back to his kitchen. Well, now we know two things, he said quietly to the girl. You didn't ask Pussfella to help you, so I guess that you don't really want to report us to the police. And we know that you're a freelance photographer, not a newspaper reporter. Good. So next, we need to find out who paid you to take pictures of me. Suddenly Bond's smile disappeared, and his eyes became cold. His voice was quiet and hard. Now, tell me who's paying you. No, I won't tell you, the girl said. She was scared, and she was in a lot of pain, but she wouldn't give Bond a name. Oh, let her go, he told Quarrel. Bond was angry with himself. He and Quarrel were certainly in great danger. Bond hated hurting women, but he decided that it was necessary tonight. However, he hadn't got what he wanted. Quarrel had nearly broken the girl's arm, but she was terrified of her boss. She'd preferred this pain to the pain that she would have if she told Bond her boss's name. The girl grabbed her camera and walked to the door. He'll kill you for this, she shouted as she left the restaurant. Well, that was a threat, Bond said to Quarrel and I'm sure that he will try to kill us. But we still don't know who he is. We can't do anything about that tonight, though. I need some sleep now. I'm going back to the hotel. 
Thank you for a very interesting evening, Quarrel. I'll see you in the morning. Chapter 6 At King's House The next morning, Bond was still thinking about the Chinese girl's threat. He was now quite sure that John Strangways and Mary Trueblood had been murdered, and he believed that they'd been murdered because of their interest in Crab Key. It was possible that whoever the murderers were, the orders for the killing had been given by the owner of Crab Key, and the owner of Crab Key was the mysterious Dr. Julius No. So it was possible that the he of Annabel Chung's threat was also Dr. No. He was certainly Bond's main suspect. Did Bond really need to find out more about Dr. No before he investigated Crab Key? He didn't think so. He knew what Quarrel and his friends thought already. But later he would talk to the British officials at King's House. He would check the information that they had in their files about the owner of Crab Key. Soon Bond would need to visit the doctor's island, but before he went there, he would spend some time with Quarrel. He had to get stronger and fitter. But the most important thing was for he and Quarrel to cover their tracks. Since he'd arrived in Jamaica, too many people had found out that Bond was working on the island. He needed to disappear, and so did Quarrel. Bond was thinking about all this as he sat finishing his breakfast in his hotel room. Someone knocked on the door. He opened it carefully, and Quarrel came into the room. Hello, Quarrel. I'm going to spend my time at King's house today, Bond told his friend. I won't need you with me, but I've got some jobs for you to do. Okay, Captain. Tell me what you want me to do, the Cayman Islander replied. Well, first, we must get rid of the Sunbeam Alpine, Bond said. I'll give you some money. Go to a car hire company. Hire a car for one month. Pay all the money now. We need a small, fast car. Next, find two men who look like us. One who looks like you and one who looks like me. Tell them that you want them to take the Sunbeam to Montego tomorrow. They must take the road that goes through Spanish Town. Tell them to leave the car in Montego. Give each man ten pounds to do this. Will you be able to find two men? Yes, Captain. That won't be difficult, Quarrel replied. There's something else, Bond went on. The men must look like us, and they must also be dressed like us. So buy them some new clothes, the kinds of clothes that we wear. They must wear these clothes when they drive the sunbeam to Montego. If they ask why, tell them that you work for a mad American, and that the clothes are his idea. Tell the men that they'll be well paid for driving the car, and tell them that they can keep the clothes. Perhaps they won't ask too many questions when they see the money. Quarrel laughed. I understand you, he said. You want to cover our tracks. So you're going to make some false tracks. You want someone to think that we are in Montego. But where will we be, Captain? We'll move to the north coast. We need some privacy, Bond replied. So the other thing that I want you to do today is this. I want you to rent a house for us on the north coast. Do you remember the house that we rented the last time we worked together? Yes, it was near Morgan's Harbor. It was in a place called Boar Desert, Quarrel replied. Find out if we can rent that house again, Bond said. If this isn't possible, try to find another house in the same area. Rent whichever house you can get for a month. Pay all the money now. Tell the company that owns the house that Mr. James wants to rent it. I'll write to them if they need more information, but get the house keys today. I won't see you again today, Quarrel, Bond went on, but please come here at 6.15 tomorrow morning. Bring the new car, and bring the men who are going to drive the Sunbeam to Montego. Be careful today, my friend. Don't let anybody follow you. We'll be in great danger until we get out of Kingston. Bond gave his friend a thick bundle of banknotes.
Here's some money, he said. That should be enough to pay for the house, the car, and the two men who will look exactly like us. Our doubles. At King's house, Bond was welcomed by the acting governor's assistant. Bond wanted to discuss the details of his mission with the assistant. But first he would have to talk to the acting governor for a few minutes and be polite to him. The acting governor's assistant took Bond into his boss's room, then he left the two men alone. Bond already knew a lot about the acting governor. The man had never been well liked anywhere. He was going to retire from government work soon, and this would be his last job. He would be working on Jamaica for only a few months more, and his only wish during this time was to avoid any trouble. Bond thought that the man was an idiot. The decision to give Strangway's sunbeam to Bond had confirmed it, and after a few minutes' conversation with the man, Bond learned more about him. The acting governor disliked all members of the Secret Intelligence Service. He wasn't interested in what had happened to Strangways and Miss True Blood, and he certainly didn't want James Bond, an acting regional controller from the SIS on the island. Mr. Bond, that file is closed, the acting governor said coldly. You must not start another investigation. Strangways and the girl have run away together. They've taken government money with them. I don't want to hear any more about it, and I don't want you making trouble on this island. That's my decision. Is there anything else that you need to do here, now that you've come? For a moment... Bond looked at the big, red-faced man without speaking. "'Yes, sir,' he replied at last. "'I'll report your ideas about Miss Trueblood and Commander Strangways to London. But while I'm here, I have to investigate something that has been happening on Crab Key. It's something about birds. The British government has asked me to do this.' Suddenly the acting governor became more friendly, and Bond knew why. Crab Key didn't belong to Britain any longer. It was owned by Dr. Julius No. If Bond caused any trouble there, it wouldn't be the acting governor's problem. He was only going to be on Jamaica for a few months more. That's a good idea, Bond, he said. Birds are very important. You must talk to the colonial secretary. He might have some information about Crab Key. The acting governor spoke a few words into a phone. A moment later, his assistant came back into the room. "'Take Mr. Bond to see Mr. Pladel Smith,' said the acting governor. An hour later, Bond was finishing his lunch. He was in a restaurant with Mr. Pladel Smith, the colonial secretary. Mr. Pladel Smith was a friendly, thirty-year-old man with untidy hair and bright, intelligent eyes. When they'd met earlier, Pladel Smith had surprised Bond. He had recognized Bond's name. He'd spoken kind words about the trouble which Bond's last visit had caused for some people at King's House. He told Bond that a few days earlier he'd found a report about Bond's last mission in Jamaica. Someone had taken the file from the storeroom and left it on a desk. Pladel Smith had read the report with interest and enjoyment. "'I hope that you can stir things up again, Commander Bond,' he said. "'It's very boring here at the moment.' What's your problem this time? Perhaps I can help you with it. They sat drinking coffee while Bond told the colonial secretary about Crab Key. When we get back to my office, I'll ask my secretary, Miss Taro, to find all the information that we have about the island, Pladel Smith said. There'll be a file of reports, and I know a little about guano myself, so I can tell you about that. As they walked back to King's house, Bond asked the colonial secretary a question about something which had been worrying him for the last hour. "'Why did someone take the file about my last visit out of the storeroom in King's house?' he asked. "'Did somebody important want to read the report?' "'Well, that was strange,' Pladel Smith answered. "'I found the file on my secretary's desk. I think that Miss Taro got it out of the storeroom. She's only worked at King's house for a few weeks. But she likes her job, and she works very hard. Perhaps she was tidying the old files and putting them into better order. As soon as the two men entered Pladel Smith's office, 
the colonial secretary picked up a phone and spoke to his secretary. "'Miss Taro, will you bring me the file on Crab Key, please? I need the report about the sale of the island, and I need the report about the warden of the bird sanctuary who died.' He put the phone down and spoke to Bond. "'Please sit down, Commander. Miss Taro will go to look for the file. While we're waiting, let me tell you all about Guano.' Bond thanked the colonial secretary and sat in the chair facing his desk. Pladel Smith was still speaking about Guano when his secretary opened the door half an hour later. "'I'm sorry, sir,' the young woman said. "'I can't find the crab key file. It's missing. It isn't in the storeroom.' "'It's missing? Well, who was the last person to use it?' the colonial secretary asked. Everyone who looks at files from the storeroom has to sign their name in a book. Commander Strangways was the last person to sign the book, sir, the girl said. But he brought the file back. He brought it to this room. I remember that well, said Pladel Smith. What happened to it after that? I don't know. I'm sorry, sir, the girl replied. Bond turned in his chair to look at the secretary and for a moment she looked carefully back at him. Then she smiled a false smile and left the room. Suddenly, Bond realized what connected his investigation with the people who had been watching him. Dr. No, Annabel Chung, and Miss Taro were all Chinese.